Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Shukran uh, Yunus. Um, we will we will start. Unlike before, um, we are not able to uh, recap on the names because we won't do justice to to recapping the names. But we're going to start, inshallah, today with the name Al Hakam. Um, now, this name, Al Hakam, the ultimate fair judge and the only judge is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, on the face of things, the name might sound very straightforward. But I think the lesson in, in, in the lessons that we can extract from this name in how we can improve our lives are tremendous. And sometimes we will find there's very little to say about the name itself because it's so bewildering. It's so beyond us. But we can, for example, take from the name uh, and apply it in our own lives in a very, very, very meaningful way. So inshallah, this name I have actually uh, taken the liberty uh, to couple this name to one of the other names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al Hasib, the accounter and the reckoner. Uh, and I have um, decided to put it together uh, and deal with it because some of the names are very similar um, and, and different people have different um, meanings that they attach to the name. It just shows us even the great scholars and the Uliya and the Arifin, the knowers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names are totally perfect and it is beyond our understanding to even get to the tip of the name. So when the scholars give us different interpretations, it shows what aspect of the name has been opened up to that particular awliya or that particular Noah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and as long as we can extract from each and every name something that we can benefit from. So I will immediately go into it because there's quite a few slides on this. Um, now the first component about uh, what we would like to touch on is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the judge, the arbitrator, the one who determines the correctness or otherwise of anything. Now it's obvious to us even in our daily world in the dunya that um, <clears throat> anyone who is called upon to judge must know every single thing about that matter. But the only one who, who knows everything about everything is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we just say that alone, that should make it very clear to us that we should not be judging others unless we are called upon in terms of our daily environment to do so. Because time never applies, and let us emphasize that time never applies to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because time never applies to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is the only one who knows things before Creation even came into existence. Allah already knew everything about everything. But when we say everything, 
we're not only talking about Allah knowing about all the facts about the matter that's to be judged, but Allah knows the conditions and the circumstances that that individual or individuals who are there to be judged, that everything that relates to their conditions and their circumstances and their surroundings, um, Allah is fully and totally aware of that. And all of those things are taken into consideration. I think the other point that's useful to remind ourselves of that the laws Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created covers every single possibility of whatever choice we're going to make under the different circumstances we find ourselves in uh, in this world. The consequences and the effects have been predetermined. Our example of um, we're standing in the passage with two doors there and uh, it doesn't matter which door we open. What is behind the door is already there. The bathroom is there. <laughs> so the opening of the door just allows us to be exposed to what has already been predetermined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right down to the finest detail. And it's a useful thing to remind ourselves that never ever is there anything that happens or knowledge that becomes known in, 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 in the dunya, is it ever new to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Nothing is ever new to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It already exists in Allah's all-knowing knowledge, pre-eternal knowledge that is already there. Now, I thought it would be useful for us just to recap on this hadith um, where Allah speaks about, uh, Rasulullah speaks about um, no fatigue, disease, sorrow, sadness, hurt, distress befalls a Muslim. Even as much as a thorn, thorn prick, then Allah will comp compensate them by removing and erasing some of the sins. Why I'm putting that up is that those conditions that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is, is, is referring to are some of the conditions that we might find ourselves in when we are going to be judged. And Allah will take any of those things or all of it, if it applies, into consideration before a judgment is actually made. And then what I did, I thought, how am I going to take this um, and, 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 and try and give it a practical um, a practical component that could be easy to understand and I came up with this income and expense account income would be what we were given and the expense is what we did with it so what I did um, if you use the example of money it's easy to understand you are given or you, you earn X amount of money and you have so much money, now you must see what you're going to do with that money. Now, when we talk about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us on the income side now, and I haven't done accountancy, it's one of the things that I uh, just picked up along the way, so if my terminology is out, <laughs> then you will forgive me. But on the income page, um, if we have been given any handicaps or disabilities, then that will be recorded on the income side as what you were given. But at the same time also, say for example, we take um, 
a person who has lost their, their sight or their hearing. The hearing will be um, recorded, the abs absence of hearing will be recorded as part of what that slave has been given. But if you've been given both your ears and you live, you've got no problem with your, then that will also be recorded. You've been given, uh, and, and, and in any instance, whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, gives us in terms of bounties, it could also be that there's a difficulty or a hardship. And then I go through all of it and I'm not going to go through all of them in that kind of detail. Um, so any difficulty, but also at the same time, if you've been given no difficulties and that everything was favorable, then that will also be recorded. Everything on that, that same page, your upbringing, your education, or your lack of that. Or when we say upbringing and education, those who manage to get good education, good upbringing, uh, both parents were around, and there was a grandmother and a grandfather, uh, and you grew up in that kind of environment, that will be recorded. But those people who, who grew up without any parents as orphans and never uh, given the opportunity to go to school, all of those things. So both the pros and the cons with respect to these matters. But even talents and abilities. Um, <laughs> and when I thought about this, um, I thought to myself, uh, if you have a, a soccer star, he's a, he's a world-class soccer star, um, and he's been granted that. That's part of his income side. But I would have loved to play soccer, <laughs> but I got two left legs. <laughs> and I can't play soccer to save my life. That will be recorded. That will be recorded as part of um, the difficulties or the test or even considered as a hardship. Because you live in an environment, especially in the Cape Flats environment, and you can't play soccer, or oh, then uh, you're almost like uh, on the outskirts of, of, of society. And of course, your health. If it's good health, it will be recorded. If it's poor health, every single thing will be recorded there. And your lifespan, um, whether it's long or short, because there's big arguments that can be made. Uh, if you've been given a long lifespan, then it can be recorded as a benefit because you've been given the opportunity to live for long in order to make toba for your previous life. And normally at the end of your life, uh, you, you try and be a bit more uh, obedient. But if you had a long life, that would be seen as a benefit. But some people could also see it. You had a long life, so, so a person who was a bit heedless and disobedient, it would have been better if he had a short life, then he wouldn't have committed so many sins. And the same would apply to a short life had Allah given you, and one can look at it from both angles. So the reason why I did this is so that we can see how complicated this thing is. For Allah to know all of those things with every specific condition and hardship, that's just one person we're trying to, to create the image of. What about the entire population? Not just now, but from the beginning of time till the end of time. And all of those people are going to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And every single thing about every single person will be known to the finest detail. By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu Akbar. So now we come to the expense page. In other words, whether it was a difficulty or a bounty that you've been given, what did you do with it? So all your deeds, big or small, whether it was good deeds or bad deeds, all of those things will be written down and will be matched against what you've been given. How much of that time did we use 
in remembrance and in devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not only, not only those things that we were compelled to do, but the things that were optional. How did we spend our time and our resources and all those other things that we just mentioned earlier? How did we use that uh, to do that? Did we serve humanity? Did we look at those around us who are in need? And not just humanity, but the rest of creation, plant, animal, and the environment. And our conduct will be judged under all the different circumstances that existed out there at the time. What did we do? These are almost the criteria that Allah will I, I just use some of what I could extract. How will we use our resources to purify our hearts and improve our behavior? What did we do, for example, if time was a criteria? The fact that people are sitting here today and we are discussing uh, the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that will be recorded as using some of your time to improve yourself and to purify your heart. So inshallah, may Allah accept from us. And then the, 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 the one that we very lack about is gratefulness. We're often only grateful if we need something and we are supplied with it. If we already have it and we've been having it for all the time, then we tend to be very, very ungrateful. In fact, it's one of the areas that Shaitan uh, mentioned. He said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, at the time when he was uh, expelled from Jannah. Um, you will find that most of your slaves will be ungrateful. <laughs> and it is so true. So when we are ungrateful, we actually giving credence to shaitan. Did we make time for repentance for all our slack and disobedience and needlessness? So nothing good or bad will be left out from the expense page. So I don't know whether this captures um, the concept of income and versus expenses. Um, and I want to just take a pause and hear if there's any comment. More to give me a time to get my breath back. <laughs> Let me just uh, stop there and just hear if there's any comment or question in terms of what was said now. Yes? Anyone? If there is a question or a comment. Uh, Balisani, um, just just in, in in looking at what has been explained, um, it it gives us an understanding of the nature of the type of judge that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is. Uh, because when we're talking about Allah Subhanahu wa Taala being the impartial judge, um, normally in a courtroom situation, the judge is presented with information by experts, and sometimes it's based on perspective and based on uh, limited knowledge that the judge has to make a decision. Whereas here, Allah subhanahu one of Allah's names is that Allah subhanahu wa is the impartial judge. And Allah is the owner of knowledge as well. So, so therefore, Allah owns the knowledge. Allah and Allah is the owner if I can, if I can put it like that, for I don't have a better word for it, but Allah is the owner of, 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 or well, basically Allah is is the judge. Yeah. Is no other judge, literally, but Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And we hear people say Allah's Allah's a judge, but literally Allah is the only judge because Allah is the only one who possesses the knowledge to be able to make to be able to pass judgment. And now we can see through the detail that Prophet is given. 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one suited to make past judgment because Allah knows all the angles, all the facts, the, the small and the large details. The things that would, that, 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 whether it's the big things or the small things and the quantities thereof. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. Now, very, very good uh, insight, uh, uh, Muhammad Fasih. Um, and let's, let's just go on. I got my breath back. <laughs> now, if you look at that, of what we've just said now about having some idea, it gives us an indication of how <clears throat> truly vast Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge is. <laughs> I mean, can one think that if, even if you were just to take the whole country of South Africa alone, the entire country, and we were to apply a fraction of this um, and put it into a computer for, 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 for every, every person, just one then, not, not even all of it, just one, uh, one line on either side. <laughs> You won't have a computer big enough just for the population of South Africa on just one aspect of what is on the one page and one aspect of what's on the other page. So when we talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, these things should, should, we shouldn't just say Allah is all powerful, all knowing. We must, we must actually feel it. And you start feeling it and you're tasting the knowledge of what you are saying when you actually go into the detail of it and think, Ya Allah, Allah is truly great. Subhanallah. So, now, whether we get the reward or not, um, is determined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala up front. Allah have measured and pre-calculated every deed and every action and weighed that in terms of benefit or punishment. So every single item in our life has a weight, every deed, every action that will have a weight that is being pre-measured so nothing is left up to the day itself. The thing about the scale measuring and so on is to, to assist us and to give us the comfort. It's, it, 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 there's going to be a process to establish whether people will go this way or that way and we have the idea of the scale. But Allah has pre-measured and pre-calculated every single thing. Now, the input should be seen as all of those things that we mentioned. Um, now, normally when we say the input, we normally talk mostly about the money component the material uh, uh, aspect of it. But there are other factors, like even a person who has um, a mood swing, for example. They've got mood swings, so they're not always in the best state to deal with whatever they, they have to deal with in their daily lives. That has a weight. And that has been measured by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah knows what you are able to do with that condition of yours and what would be too much and what would be too little. So now you're at home and the children are breaking the stuff and they're screaming and they're shouting and you've got work to do and there's a phone call and everything else and you behave in a particular way. Allah has measured every single thing and then your reaction will be weighed against all of that. Now, if you think your entire life, every single aspect of your life has been measured, 
Subhanallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so, 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 so marvelous, so great. But now you've been given that, Allah also knows, have you fully used what I've given you? Have you fully used what I've given you? And you know, this is where many of us are going to fall short. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you the ability to think and to reason, you must remember not everyone has been given your ability. You've been given that special ability. Don't think you 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 <laughs> clever, <laughs> but just realize that that special ability to reason and think is something that somebody else may not have been given. So now you're going to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah is going to ask you to account for that intellect that Allah gave you. Your specific intellect, not intellect as a, as a human uh, quality. Your specific intellect that you've been given. How have you used it? And now Allah knows already whether you've used it to the maximum or whether you have abused it, or whether you have just wasted it completely. And especially when it comes to seeking knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let me make that point very clear. It's not going to be good enough to say we've been raised like this uh, and grew up in a home like this. If Allah gave you a special type of mind to reason, and have exposed you to certain types of knowledge and you've not maximized it, you're actually going to get a hiding. You're going to be punished for that because Allah didn't give it to anyone else. Allah gave it to you and yet you didn't use it. You didn't make effort to find out more about who is Allah, Allah's sifat, Allah's names. So, at least a little bit of effort we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for not maximizing the things that we've been given, especially as far as our intellect and the opportunity is concerned. Yeah, and we're going to have to account for every bit of laziness or excuses that we made why we couldn't do this or that. Um, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows exactly the reason that you are using for doing, especially for not doing certain things, Allah will know if it is so or is not so. You can't come with a reason where you try and with your clever mind try and persuade the judge uh, or the magistrate. Um, uh, yes, and, 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 and you're so eloquent and then you are able to persuade the judge or floor the, 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 the prosecutor with your argument and so on. Allah knows exactly what the truth is, no matter what you say and how you make excuses for it. Now there are two ways. Two ways. If we want to emulate this name now. Now we're looking at, we have some idea of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the judge um, of what we're going to do. We know Allah is fair. We know Allah is just. And we know that Allah knows everything about it. Okay, so now we know about the name. So now we walk away and keep that in mind. The other part that we must add to this is the action. What do we extract from this name so that we can learn from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the Quran and Sunnah, but also through his names and his sifat of what we should do to, to become Allah's Khalifas on earth. When we, when, when, when we are supposed to be Allah's Khalifas on earth, we're supposed to emulate and copy. We can't copy all Allah's sifat, but we must copy whatever we can to become the true representatives of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the dunya. Now the first way to copy the name is 
um, in circumstances where people, even as a parent or even as a, a child amongst other children, um, let's take the example of a parent. The parent, there's two children in the house, both are crying. Both are claiming that they are right. The parent must now make a judgment whether the parent likes it or not. You are called upon in certain circumstances and instances to be a judge now. <laughs> now I'll tell you something lighthearted afterwards. <laughs> um, you're supposed to judge what is going to happen now. You, 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 you got no choice. Now, in a case like that, you must equip yourself with all the information. You can't even think of just grabbing uh, the one and, 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 and assuming that the naughty one has been naughty now again. You must first equip yourself with all the information and give both opportunities, uh, both of them an opportunity to state what they think uh, has gone wrong. So you must take all the factors into consideration. <laughs> Let me just tell you something lighthearted. <laughs> so this man had, he had, he had nine boys. Um, and the one boy was always naughty. He somehow or other always got in trouble. So his wife came to him and he said, and, and his wife asked um, who broke that, uh, he asked his wife, who broke something in the house? She says, she, don't, she doesn't know. Uh, the, the, the boys were playing out there. Um, and then the naughty one, he called him and he gave him a smack. And he said, yeah, but father, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't even there. I said, okay. Take the smack for when you are going to be naughty tomorrow. <laughs> um, we can't behave like that. We have to actually get all the factors, um, you know, f familiarize ourselves with it. And you can't behave like that father. He was biased towards that child because that child is normally the naughty one. So now it's assumed. How often don't we do the same thing? Um, sure. I've seen and heard about terrible examples of people who have um, uh, domestic helpers. So the person took something on that day and admitted. So now the next time something goes missing, it's assumed that that person stole that thing. How often didn't you think that the person stole that thing and you find it out afterwards that it wasn't stolen, it was just misplaced? So we can't be biased and we can't be unfair if we're placed in positions of having to judge. So judging is something that you must make sure that it is no other uh, alternative and you must give a judgment, then it is important to make sure that you don't exercise uh, unfairness. And of course, you can't do it with arrogance because you are now the judge. Um, you want to treat people in a disdainful way. In a, in a demeaning way, in an in a, in a, um, uh, embarrassing and uh, you look down on them because you're in charge now. And they must accept what you're going to say because you're in charge. You're doing it in a very high-handed, arrogant, uh, vain way that is clearly unacceptable. And listen to mitigating circumstances. Even the, the, the courts here, yeah, if, you, if, you, if you appear in, 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 a, in, in a court of law here, yeah, the judge asks you off, before I give my judgment, 
do you have anything uh, to say in mitigation? In mitigation, uh, the Afrikaans word is versachtend, uh, to soften whatever is, you, you deserve a particular punishment. Is there anything I should take into consideration to lessen, lessen the, the punishment? Especially if in your own assessment now, uh, you've come to a point where you've determined who is right and who is wrong. Um, do it with compassion. Do it with a way that you are aware that there's going to be punishment that's not going to be easy for the, for the recipient. Um, and don't do it in a gloating way and in an arrogant way. Show compassion. It's so important to, to, to actually do it like that. <clears throat> The second way of how we must emulate this name is, in fact, more, more crucial. And that's the one that we're going to be, be, be speaking about now. But the first part is something that we say, but I'm not a judge, I'm not a lawyer, I've, I'm never placed in, we are in our normal circumstances. We are called upon to be judges. Uh, whether it is your wife or your husband or your children, they call on you to give a judgment uh, on various occasions. So I just want to pause on that and just find out if there's anything anyone wish to raise um, at this point um, before, we, before we move on to the to the second part of how we should implement it. Let's just hear. Uh, but certainly, um, do we, can, can we make a distinction between being called upon to make a judgment on a matter and judging someone? Uh, what I mean by that is that uh, sometimes we unnecessarily judge someone we unnecessarily pass judgment without being called upon to do so. So does that also, in a sense, uh, fall not necessarily in the, this category, but does it impact here? No, what I, 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 in, I, in fact, what you are raising is extremely relevant and probably more relevant than the first part. Uh, but I was saying, we're going to deal with, with what you are raising now, where we, you, you are passing judgment without necessarily having been called upon to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about instances where your circumstances require of you. The father has got two children or the mother has got two children crying here in front, both claiming to be right. Judge. Now in cases like that, that's slightly different. Or you the uh, chairman of the disciplinary committee in a work situation. Um, Somebody has been uh, accused of misconduct. Um, there's a hearing. You're the chairman. You actually have to determine whether that person is guilty or not. Or obviously in other cases where you're a magistrate and so on, where that is part of your job function. But we are called upon, even in our everyday lives, where we actually have to make a decision of who's right and who's wrong. Uh, not, not because we have a choice or we choose to do it. It's just our circumstances require us now to, to do something. Is there, is there uh, or should I just go on to the, the, the next part? Then we can discuss it. Let me go on to the next part. <clears throat> the next part deals with what Muhammad Fasih has, has raised now. It's not part of your job, but you come across something that in your opinion is not correct. And you make a judgment. 
that's right or that's not right. Or you should have or you could have. Now those are the things that's very dangerous. Now we are treading on very dangerous ground because Let me just go back to the screen. You are judging others now. You're not called upon to do it. Who's the only one that knows everything about everything? You. <laughs> You're just walking past. You see a man coming out of um, the bottle store. And you're judging him now. We're not even going to go further than that. You, or you might even go and see him sitting at the bar. You might even see him picking up a bottle and drinking from the bottle. Have you actually taken the bottle and tasted some of what he tasted to say that he drank liquor. He consumed liquor. You only see him in that area where wrong is being committed and you judge. You see him doing something that appears to be wrong, but you don't know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has very strict rules when it comes to calling witnesses. You are actually saying you have witnessed a wrong. <laughs> and now you make a judgment too. We must be extremely, extremely, extremely careful. Because what is the first qualification right at the beginning of when we started uh, with, this, with this name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We said... A prerequisite is you must know everything about the matter that is to be judged. Not just the facts about the matter, but the circumstances, the personal, individual difficulties that that person was under at the time when you observed something. We don't even know a fraction. We, we, we don't even, we know nothing. We've just seen a boof, we make a judgment. Now that is of the most dangerous things. And what is the biggest sin? What is the single biggest sin? Yunus, what's the single biggest sin? In life, in life, general to ascribe partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Are you not setting yourself up as a partner who is equipped enough like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala subhanahu wa ta'ala to do what Allah says is his job? And you say, wait, no, I've seen this. I'm going to make a judgment. We must be extremely careful. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's territory. It belongs to Allah. Don't go in there. Don't go even go close to it. Because you don't have the equipment. You don't have the knowledge. You don't have the training. You don't have the ability. You have nothing that comes close to the requirement of actually judging. And the sooner we remind ourselves about that, the better. Because... Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jailani Qadda Sallahu Sirnazi says, We must judge ourselves. That's different. Judge yourself. Judge yourself harshly. Be, 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 be harsh on yourself. You could have done more, man. You didn't do your best. Limit it to yourself. Don't go beyond that. And then you say, in comparison to other people, that you are better than no one. Not even 
uh, better than non-Muslims, not even better than the, the obvious sinner, because we know what the story is, the non-Muslim person can tomorrow uh, become a Muslim and his slate is wiped clean, and he's already better than you. Uh, we look at Sayyidina um, Umar, radiallahu an, the second Khalifa of Islam. We all know his history prior to becoming a Muslim. Subhanallah, that Allah could have made him one of the few people while he was alive who was promised Jannah while he was alive. So we can't judge other people. They were this or they did that in the past. Tomorrow they become and they become 10 times, 100 times, 1000 times better than you. And never use, never use other things also like wealth. You've got more and you judge other people to be less than you. You've been exposed to an education where you've got degrees, more than one degree, or you've been qualified in a particular area and you keep yourself as if you are so much better than the people who are junior to you and you judge them to be lesser than you because of what you got. So if Allah has given you something, apply that to your own life and never apply it to other people. Now, before I come to the advice that we've been given, now I want to pose the question, are we saying we should never judge? What if, what if, 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 if you with, with your friend or your family or your brother or your children um, and they are doing something that's wrong? You, you, uh, let me use a practical example. The Muadhin uh, gives the call to prayer. Um, and you, you, you are there and you respond to the call and you're going to make salah now. Um, and your brother or your friend, um, he just continues with whatever he's doing. Do you have the right to judge him? He says at the, he's play, playing TV games now. You have the right to judge him. I, I think the... that's funny. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, I think if we consider the the advices from from our teachers, um, and especially Shahazim Hafizullah, he said we need to make seventy excuses for our brothers, even though we might see something as we consider being bad. Um, Kusna Zan, um the good thoughts um, about Allah, about uh, the Prophet وسلم, his companions, about our own friends and brothers, and relatives, um, and making excuses for them, um, just based on the fact that tomorrow, tonight, that person can can repent, and that that sin or something bad can be wiped away clean. And Allah might through that sincerity in his in his repentance raise his status to an awliya. So in terms of having to judge others, um, we uh, uh, we need to be very cautious and rather side on on, on, on caution rather than an harsh judgment. Um, and I think <clears throat> what stood out for me was the, the concept of judging with compassion. Um, because today we might reprimand somebody so harshly. And we might chase him away uh, from, from the deen of Islam. Um, I remember reading a story where this woman who, was, who, who attended an Islamic conference and she had no scarf on and, you know, aura was exposed. And this person, this, this uh, 
he was he was considered a scholar, a lecturer, uh, one of the case speakers, and he was tempted to go up to this woman and say, um, "Sorry, ma'am, you know, uh, don't think you should come in." On three different occasions prior to the actual content starting, he was so tempted to tell her, "Look, you know, rather stay away. This is a Muslim uh, uh, um, conference meeting or whatever." And then during his lecture, he spoke and he spoke. And then after it happened, this lady came up to him and she said, "I want to embrace Islam, just based on this talk today." And you know, and then he said, "Subhanallah, so easily you could have literally chased her away." And she wouldn't have gotten the guidance. Um, so having to judge with compassion and 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 mercy uh, is above being just uh, being uh, doing the right thing. Doing sometimes doing the right thing can be a bad thing. <laughs> in this in in this example. <laughs> okay. Let me ask if there's anyone else who would like to add to that. Remember what my question is. It is obvious now that it's time for salah. Um, and this person. Uh, the one is going and the other one is not. The one who's going, what, what must he do? From what he's observing, he is seeing that the other <coughs> is not doing what he's supposed to do. Um, where does that fall in with us staying away and leaving judgment only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Let's, let's hear if there's somebody else would like to add to that. The first point is, uh, is, is 100 percent correct, Yunus. Alhamdulillah, mashallah, that's great. But yeah. uh, 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 if if I think about it this way, uh, a believer is described as someone who enjoys what is good and forbids what is evil. Uh, so ultimately, uh, a Muslim cannot turn a blind eye to something that is not right. But I think that when it comes to passing judgment, one cannot condemn someone based on the actions, but one can advise them in line with what is best for the akhirah, I think. So the person, I would say, who is going to perform salah, he can give that nasiha, that a good advice, to the other one and say, a brother, it is a time for the walk of the or asr. You know, this is not going to benefit you as much in the akhirah as going to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I don't judge you or berate you. Only Allah can judge. But I would advise you to spend your time more productively for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then after having given that nasiha, that person without judgment, without seeing themselves as being higher than the other person, without having a higher hand, he does and he parts his duty and then he goes on and he performs salah. Whether the person themselves will absorb that information or whether they will uh, choose to remain uh, heedless, he has delivered his message and I think he's, 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 he's dispensed with his duty. Alhamdulillah. It's a combination of both what you said Muhammad Fasir and what Yunus said. You actually have to take the first and the second part and combine it when you approach matters like this. You have an obligation as a Muslim to enjoin good and forbid bad insofar as you observe it as long as you do it in the way that Eunice has outlined how we should deal with fellow Muslims. In fact, generally, we shouldn't, we shouldn't, we must make excuses for people and not assume that they're guilty or wrong. But because you're the one telling him what is right or what is wrong, that shouldn't give you the right to judge his level of piety. I so khurati bliss. I don't know what chalan. I put him out of mind. You've you've put him in a category, you've judged him. We don't, you, you might even be right. Allah knows best. Uh, but it's not our domain. You can, you, you mustn't even think it. It's better to stay away from, from those things. Um, because you will find that some people often need to be reminded. They need to almost be, 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 be forced 
to uh, you know the horse you could force the uh, horse to uh, to the well to go and drink but you can't force him to drink they say but this horse needs to be forced every time um, you tempted them to actually include the other thing keep your keep your art clear from uh, these activity the kind of activity like that kind of thing if you do it even without the full intention of judging but you are in fact doing that then what it does it clouds your heart the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can't enter and whatever is is of goodness remains outside of your heart because there is so much that is preventing it from entering the heart so it's a combination of both what Yunus and Muhammad Fasifa said you make excuses and give people always the benefit of the doubt and let Allah be the judge there but that doesn't mean you must refrain from doing your duty as a Muslim in joining good and forbidding bad where it's obvious Alhamdulillah. so we'll go to the last part Allah Akbar. Sheikh Hazim Hafid Allah, may Allah be very pleased with him. SubhanAllah. This man has opened so many doors and so many hearts. May Allah call on all of us one day bear witness that he has played his role. He has played his role. And we can bear testimony to that, inshallah. We should all take the, his books, especially the two books that he gave to us that we've been having on our shelves forever. Very, very few people have actually gone through both books. The only reason why I, I can say I went through the books because I was, I was part of the editing of these books. So I was compelled to go through it a few times. <clears throat> But so many people have left the books on the shelves and have never really made effort to dive into this ocean of profound and deep advice and knowledge. Al Mursid Hafid Allah says that <clears throat> if you recite this name, Al Hakam, after every salah, you will be granted understanding and wisdom. Now let me just say something about wisdom. <clears throat> you can be the most educated person under the sun. That doesn't mean that you have wisdom. You've seen that all around you. That people who are sometimes highly qualified in their subject matter, but they lack wisdom. Because wisdom comes directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wisdom does not come through your own personal effort. Let me make that clear. Wisdom does not come because you have achieved it by doing X or Y and now you get wisdom. I've done my matric, I've got the certificate. It's not like that. Wisdom comes as a pure blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How? That's up to Allah. All we are required is to put in the sincere effort 
and Allah will see the state of your heart and Allah will grant you wisdom. And wisdom is the first step on the ladder of true knowledge. You have wisdom, you at the level of now where you are in a position to receive knowledge that's close to other people. You're at the door of where the Arifin are. Their wisdom is profound. They can see wisdom in something um, that would, would be very obscure to us. So if Allah grants you understanding, the understanding should be taken in terms of understanding of not just worldly matters, but understanding of getting to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is a tremendous, tremendous. So if you take this name and you say, this is the name I'm going to attach myself to, then that is what our Sheikh says. And subhanallah, <laughs> our Sheikh says, you will be counted amongst the people of nearness and arrival. <sighs> the people of nearness and arrival. Allahu Akbar. I don't, I don't, I don't even want to touch on this, but <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Nearness to Allah is obviously not something that can be associated with space or location. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have form. Allah doesn't occupy space. And when we say arrival, it means that you are of the people who will be allowed into the divine presence. Now the divine presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a place. It's not something that can be described no matter what you, words are used, not just by me, but even of the people who have arrived, truly arrived. They can't use words to describe it because it's indescribable. You're actually talking about what the Arifin speak about, the knowers of Allah speak about, tasting, tasting the knowledge, and then drinking, and then quenching. <laughs> so it's the first step that if you use this name, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open up for you the opportunity to be counted amongst the people of nearness and arrival. And then Sheikh finally states that um, if you repeat this name in the middle of the night with wudu, um, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make your heart a place of divine secrets and illuminate your face with this divine nur. Subhanallah. You just have to look at our Sheikh and you can see he is a recipient of that. He might be sick. He might be in whatever state physically, but you look at him or you're in his presence, then you feel that radiance, that baraka, that nur, and you're affected by it. You can't explain it. Uh, the times when I was fortunate enough to be um, with Sheikh uh, in, in Sheikh Hazim Allah's uh, presence and people ask me so how was it? What can you say? Yunus, <laughs> Yunus has been fortunate enough also to have that experience to, for us to stay with Sheikh there in Jordan Allahu Akbar, you can't, you can't describe it. 
It's not describable because you are using your senses to describe. <coughs> Subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about, or Sheikh speaks about, Allah will make your heart a place of divine secrets and illuminate not just your face but your heart with, with his nur. Then um, that is something that we must experience to benefit from it. It's not something that, that's intended for the mind. Um, it's intended for the heart. So these are extremely wise words. I am going to try and take whatever name our Sheikh uh, has dealt with, um, where we will try and go through whatever Sheikh says about the name and add it as the last last part to to our um, but I would still advise everyone to make a special effort to go through Sheikh's book um, and be quite nice to take Sheikh's book uh, Imam Ghazali's book we've dealt now with the with with with, with Al Hakam and Al Hasib um, the, the two names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala look it up read through it take whatever I have done here, put it together, and then sit back and ask yourself, what have you actually extracted from them? And can I remind all of us, including myself, that we must take one or two of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and attach ourselves to those names. You can change down the line if you want to add to it, but try early on already to take one or two of the names. Of course, the best place to start is with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah. But go into not just saying it, but go into and attach yourself um, by looking at what we've said earlier about the Hawa and, 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 and this name actually being the umbrella name and attach yourself for, for a start do that and then the other name Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Subhanallah uh, we start we start with everything we say Bismillah Ar-Rahman in the name Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim uh, oh, there start there then and then afterwards you can take your personal special uh, <laughs> Uh, pet name, if one can call it that, uh, and, and, and treat it because there are some, there are some, subhanallah, there's, there's some pearls, there's jewels, there's, there's things that's locked up in, 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 in the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's waiting to be discovered. And you must do your own, you must enter and, and, and travel that path on your own. Sheikh has exposed us to it and everyone will have their own personal journey. So I want to leave it like that, inshallah. Um, <clears throat> maybe there are some final comments or questions that people would like to ask at this stage. Floor is open. Masali, I think for, for my own sake, um, and, and hopefully it will help everyone, inshallah, is to never be safe, never be safe in, in what we think is, like, like uh, speaking about, you know, the, the, the expense sheet, um, our nafs tend to think, oh, I, I, I'm Salah, I was standing up with the Hajjud, I'm gave Sadaka, I keep family ties, you know, I'm safe. Um, and that's a very grave error and quite dangerous um, because I'm sure many of us know the, the story of the, the pious worshipper who was up in the mountains in seclusion for a thousand years um, and just worshipped Allah 24-7 for many, many, many years. And uh, on the day of, uh, and it is narrated to us that uh, when, when, Standing in front of Allah, he said, enter my Jannah through my mercy. 
and then they said, no, I want to go through my deeds, and and we now that story unfolded. So according to our judgment, we would say, wow, mashallah, he spent all his life, you know, hundreds of years in this worship, Allah, nothing else. Wow, he's a Jannati, mashallah. And, and yet, you know, it was so close that he ended up in, 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 in in the health I am Allah protect us. So the one reflection for me is never to, to be safe in our judgment. Um and and to have the the judgment between the two advices that we shared today by Ahmad Basi. Um you know and we don't know everything. So leave judgment at, in total. <laughs> leave the judgment in total. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Just to say, uh, Yunus, I uh, don't want to uh, differ with you about the story, the narration about the person when he said that he's going to Jannah through his deeds. Then Allah said, okay, now repay me for this debt. And then he made Tawbah. So he didn't go to Jannah. Allah still exercised his Rahmah and said, and he said, I make Tawbah, I go to Jannah only through your Rahmah. And Allah says, go through. So he didn't end up on the wrong side. Yeah, he was happy. Yeah, Allah allowed him to enter Jannah after he acknowledged that he's going there. Anything else? Any final comment or question? I, th I think also just to add on to what uh, uh, Yunus has said in terms of us not ever feeling safe in our own judgments. Um, I think we come from a very interesting community, a community that is very spiritual, alhamdulillah. We're very fortunate in Cape Town. However, as a community, we also have very bad habits. One of those bad habits is judgment, passing judgment upon each other. And I think that this lesson is key for us as a community because it, it, it teaches us that number one, at the forefront of our deen is to understand that you can never make partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so therefore, not in any of Allah's abilities can we assign an equal. And sometimes we make shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without even realizing it by virtue of placing ourselves in a position which we do not deserve. And we compete with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of those things. And I find that all of us, to a large degree, sometimes are guilty of this. We are guilty of, 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 of passing judgment or saying things, whatever. And our community is such that it encourages those types of talks sometimes because it makes for interesting conversation or it, it makes for a um, yeah, basically a, a interesting banter. Hmm. And so this is a very stark lesson for us that if we want Allah's Rahmah, then firstly, we must exercise that Rahmah and if we want Allah subhanahu wa justice, then we must exercise the justice within ourselves and with others. InshaAllah. InshaAllah. Shukran uh, Muhammad Fasih for that reminder. Uh, just to say about the, um, this thing about judging others forms an integral part of slander and backbiting. We judge and we use that judgment to slander others. So you combine that, not only are we setting ourselves up as partners, but we're doing one of the worst sins. And that is slander. Can we, can we just make sure that we take the advice at a very practical level and implement it for ourselves and remind people in a compassionate way polite way um, when we observe that people are doing things that is unacceptable um, you can't go and insult somebody if you want to correct them then uh, you, are, you are harming that person you must do it in a way where whatever advice you are giving uh, is done in a way where the advice will actually be welcomed and accepted not be uh, reacted to and, 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 and with hurt. We are supposed to be like Allah in this land. 
Allah is merciful. Allah is loving. Allah is kind. Allah is compassionate. If we look at how we behave as human beings, we are so, so, so different to what we are supposed to be, the representatives, the khalifas of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any final uh, comments or questions? Shabnam, anything you wish to say at this stage? Uh, I think we always need to ask Allah for guidance. Sometimes we are in a position where we have to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even when the information that we get from others around you, you don't know whether it's the truth or it's not the truth. And when you have to make a decision, you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he allows you to make the best decision. Nice. And as Chef um, Mani was saying, if there's people that, if you see someone drinking, have you tasted what's in there? Perhaps he had a bad habit and maybe he's washed that bottle out and he's just drinking water from there. Uh, and psychologically, maybe that gives him ease of, ease yeah. of mind, but he has actually kicked that habit of drinking and he's not drinking. Yeah. And he's probably just drinking water from there. So we should never judge anyone. Yes. For the, the editing. So let us consciously take that last point and say if we are compelled to, by circumstances to sit in judgment of a, of a particular issue, or ask for guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you don't know everything. So if we can take all the little bits and pieces, then inshallah we put it together. We've got a nice package of issues. Uh, to become better people, <laughs> inshallah. Um, Muhammad Fasih, are you going to make dua for us? Inshallah, me. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ir-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa al-asr inna al-insan wa fi khusr illa al-ladina amanu wa amilu al-salihat wa tawasaw bil-haq wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Inna Allah wa malaikat wa yasalluna ala al-nabi ya inna al-ladina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallim wa taslima. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa sahabi wa alayhi wa sallim. Allahumma aftah lana bil-khayr wa akhtim lana bil-khayr wa ja'ala awakiba umurina bil-khayr. يالك الحير والعافية إنك على كل شيء قدير دعوهم فيها سبحانك اللهم وتحياتهم فيها سلام وأحل دعوهم من الحمد لله رب العالمين شكرا very much to everyone who uh, we were unsure whether we're going to have the session I'm very glad because I believe it was extremely useful um, I wanted to just tell you what the next one is that we're going to do um, so that you have an idea. Yeah. Uh, Allahu Akbar. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Al Qatar, the opener. Let's make the uh, effort. <laughs> there, there, there's things here yeah, locked up uh, in, 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 in this exercise of going through the names that um, we shouldn't miss. We shouldn't miss. Um, and I hope, inshallah, we will all make a special attempt to be part of uh, the next. <laughs> Inshallah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you all say, Inshallah. Shukran tibida sali, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Zakallah khair al jazaa. Shukran to everyone else, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look after everyone, and keep, and keep us all safe. Things are getting, um, sure, this COVID-19 thing is getting, to a different level now. Um, let's hope, inshallah, that Allah will bring ease to everyone, uh, not only through the COVID-19 issues, but in any form of difficulty or hardship that they're experiencing in their lives, issues of health or, or, or income or even the relationships that Allah must bring ease and comfort Amen. to everyone. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa
وعليكم السلام ورحمه الله وبركاته انت سالي